Hey everybody, I'm Steve Rubenstone. Um, I met Adam a couple of meetups ago and was asking some interesting questions. So thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm curious, out of the people here, I mean, this is a beginner focused orientation um, of, of these LLM models. How many of you are like true beginners? Okay, cool. How many of you are like, have some experience with software development? I'm just curious. Okay, awesome. So a little bit of background about me very quickly. I'm a software engineer, product manager. I've worked in the startup world, corporate world. I've been working on a startup for the past six months called Upskill Hero, this micro learning platform that's utilizing some pretty cool LLM mm -hmm. techniques and prompt engineering to create custom courses for people. So I have learned a lot about the art form of working with these very magical, insanely powerful tools, which are large language models. And I thought it would be fun to give a very quick intro to uh, the subject. So let's begin. Um, we can, if you scroll up to the top of the doc, I'm going to keep this very simple and kind of a little more playful today. So if you can click on my fundamentals meme right here. If you get a scroll down, um, just bear with us to the, the staircase picture, it's a meme. You've probably seen this one before here. So when you're learning anything new as a beginner, I think a lot of you may know, you need the fundamentals to be great at whatever you're doing. And that really is important with software. It's crazy how similar the things that I'm doing have been even as a software engineer. If you get a couple of things really well, you can really excel. But when you start to make these jumps and you don't really understand programming that well, and then you jump all the way into working with these language models, you're going to struggle. So it's a prerequisite that you've got to be a good programmer to programmatically work with a large language model for now until they take over the world and we have no jobs in scale. But now, and a very interesting point, I was actually working with O1, the brand new thought-based model yesterday, and it took me a time to update an interface. Okay. Enjoy the we'll for a while. Um, the human being okay. needs to be there. These things are incredible tools, but I don't think they're taking over the world anytime soon. So make sure you understand how to work with asynchronous programming, because what's very interesting when working with these language models is that it takes a little bit longer than you would expect to get a response. Usually when you're working with APIs, it takes a second or two to get a response. But in the class, uh, in the application I'm working, sometimes the response takes 20 seconds. So how do you handle that loading state? How do you keep it fun for the user? It's like programming is changing a little bit. So you have to be great with async programming. All right, that's all I'll say on fundamentals. So we can get off this, go back to the Google Doc. Um, now, I got a little graphic here. When we talk about fundamentals, everything that's happening today with ChatGPT under the hood, working with LLMs, you're doing basically the same operation every single time at a fundamental level. The way that OpenAI designed this, and OpenAI is controlling the space, is it's an assistant. It was designed as a chatbot. And what does that mean? It means that you are getting a response to a conversation. What is a conversation? It's a series of messages. And going a little bit more in depth, it's a series of labeled messages. And in the case of modern LLMs, there are three different types of messages. And this is, if you can understand this, you basically learn 75% of working with prompt engineering and open AI and leveraging the most powerful thing that's maybe ever been built by humanity. That's debatable, but it's pretty insane what it is. So really all you're doing, and this is kind of how my mind thinks about it, is that you're sliding a list of objects, which are chat messages, into the chat completion API from OpenAI or a similar model. And those chat messages can either be a system message, which we'll talk more about, but this is kind of like the all-powerful guidance message that explains to OpenAI what the flavor of the bot or the language model should take on. It's kind of like a personality description, extremely powerful. The second is an assistant message. So this is a message that's been previously written by the AI. Because remember, if you're in a chat conversation, the AI would have already responded a few times and the API needs to understand 
who it is. It's like identifying itself in the conversation. So you've got system message, the assistant message, and then what do you think the third message type is? It's the human. It's the, the human chat messages. And that's basically every time you're hitting OpenAI's chat completion API, there are different endpoints for Dolly, image, you know, image generation, and other more sophisticated things, but you can do extraordinary things with the chat completion API. This is what ChatGPT is under the hood when you're messaging it in the UI on the web. Um, the exact same thing is happening. And yeah, so messages go in, a new message from the assistant comes out. You now all know how to program the chat completion API, as long as you know how to program. <laughs> uh, like you understand JavaScript, you understand Python, okay? So that's what I, I'm talking about by just getting those fundamentals. And um, if you X, oh, not X off this, sorry. We're gonna go to the OpenAI docs and just look at this more formally without a, a metaphor. So this is it. Um, if you wanna get good with working with these large language models, just print this on your forehead. Um, this is, again, it, it goes back to that Pareto principle if you understand this, you can just start building unbelievably powerful things. Maybe it won't be enterprise grade just yet, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. So this is the, this is the Python library. You're either going to be working directly with the API endpoint, the chat completions endpoint, or you're using a Python library or the Node.js library, uh, OpenAI library. And you're essentially selecting the model you want to use, which is kind of crazy because as a developer, when they upgrade a model, and you've built the right infrastructure. Because these models are so powerful, like when O1 comes out, all I have to do is delete these characters and type in O1. And now I just upgraded my system by like $500 billion. Like there's a lot of power in here because it's trippy and just, just how magical this stuff is. So you got your model, uh, you're using the library, and then you're passing in an array of objects. And there's two keys in these objects. It's the role, as I mentioned, it can be system, it can be user, which is the human or the assistant. And then content is the message. And th this is uh, placed linearly in terms of the chat. So like oldest message and the next message. And then this just gets pumped into an API request every time you want a response from GPT. And that is what's happening under the hood when you are using ChatGPT. So if you have five messages in there and it's respond, responded three times and I say, how do I improve my, um, my hairstyle today? I don't know. You're basically just taking all the previous messages, making this response, I mean, sorry, this request. Remember, this is an asynchronous call and with a very quick and simple uh, chat it may respond very quickly but when you start to get to the what this thing can really do like, like write a book for me or something which you can do you have to be a good enough programmer to be able to understand how to handle d delays in your application so that's what i meant about fundamentals and then understanding open ai and that is the chat completion api you can get started with this immediately everything else all these fancy buzzwords where you're talking about fine tuning um, retrieval augmented generation, you're, you're working somewhat just, you're basically enhancing this. Um, but this stuff is fancy. You can do unbelievable things just with this knowledge. So um, I'm moving, moving pretty quickly here. Adam told me to keep it simple, keep it quick, but uh, maybe I'll stop right there. Uh, any, any questions on what I've covered? Anything does it, that anybody wants to build that's like aching to build something cool with this? Any ideas? Can you elaborate a little bit on the role of assistant message, where I know the model um, already itself has like lots of information in them. So is that is the assistant uh, an optional system? Uh, assistant uh, message? Is you refer to the one here? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Steven, just so for the thing you repeat Yes, so what's your name? Sorry. Rita. Rita's question is just explaining a little bit more about what this system message is and if it's optional. Uh, that's a good segue because that is the next topic of this presentation. So we could go um, into point four here. 
Uh, maybe scroll down a little bit. Just get that paragraph here. <clears throat> so the system message is incredibly powerful. It's really important to understand what it is. And they don't talk enough about it in the articles I've read. They do a good do job documenting it, but they don't really talk that much about it in articles like tutorials. So one, it's extremely powerful for a few reasons I'll talk about in a second. But there's a very weird thing that starts to happen when you work with these LLMs, which is it's not it's not hard to find the process in some situations, how you get an output. So there's a real art form here that's never existed in the software world. Software is you have inputs, you have outputs, you do things in a very precise way and things work or they don't. Here, something changes with these LLMs and I can, I'm gonna show you that. I can't show you everything in this talk, but I wanna show you some of the weird stuff that you might not find anywhere else. But first, let me address your question. So let's just read from the docs, it's a little dry, but it's so important. Uh, this is the definition of the system message. In OpenAI's chat completions, the system message plays a key role in guiding the behavior and tone of the AI model. It is the initial message that sets the context for the conversation, defining how the model should respond. This message helps control the assistant's behavior, defining its role and providing instructions on how to interact with the user. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all that, you can read it. Basically, this is where you tell the bot, be a Socratic tutor answer uh, in, the, in the app that I'm building, I use a system message for a specific bot to actually annoy users, where I actually say be a pest, because that bot is controlling a character uh, in the game. And everything, it adjusts to everything based on that personality system message context that you give it. You don't have to give it a system message, um, but it's gonna dramatically enhance the quality of the results. So the personality, the intent, the purpose, because it's so open-ended what a chat bot can be, you're gonna wanna give it guidance. I'm gonna keep it as simple as that and you'll see that probably immediately with working with it. Um, scroll down a little bit. So I wanna make sure that I answered your question well. Did, was that a good enough answer? Because I can give more clarity if there's more, more context you want me to give you. Um, yeah, I guess just to reiterate, there's a lot of examples of system messages is a good way to learn, but it is essentially like giving it a personality or an intent. So this is something that I've learned with now working with OpenAI for about 365 days now, seven days a week is just this art form. And this is weird, it's really cool, which is there's two ways to think about the system prompt. And I'm just trying to like make your mind bend a little bit to open your heads up to what this thing really is. So you have, this almost sounds like a meme, it's kind of funny. Would you rather insert chat messages with a system prompt like I showed you, or would you rather insert a system prompt with chat messages? Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So the first way, um, can you go back to the docs here? This is the standard way of doing things. You have a system message and then you have all your messages, right? You can say you are a helpful assistant, you are Socrates answer in his voice. But if you go back to my document, what's so weird about these LLMs, what's so cool is that the system message is a string that you pass in as a developer and you control it. It's dynamic. You can make it a hundred pages long, depending on how much you want to spend and the context length is. But just as a thought experiment, instead of passing in any chat messages in that array, I could just pass in the system message and then use my own formatting, like this was message one, this was message two, and these would change and would be dynamic because my application is populating that system message string. And then I could even have that system message. I, this is where it becomes insanely powerful is the JSON mode, which uh, OpenAI like newly integrated into their newer versions like 4.0, where if you really know what you're doing, this thing is, you always have it respond with a JSON object. So I can have it respond with the message, but I could also tell my backend, for example, can you rank how interesting this conversation is? And I can store that as like a way to rank content in my social network. So I can have this thing can do so much more than even respond with the chat message. I have uh, an upskill hero, the, this micro learning app that we're building, 
I have prompts now that are like five pages long and ob uh, JSON objects that are being 20 different keys. Um, you know, every, so many things you can learn, like think really cool stuff like who was the most interesting user in this chat? Let's award them 10 XP points. And then I'll get a key like most interesting user and I'll also get the chat message response. Point is this system message is so powerful. You can do things against the documentation and just, and that's just the creativity of it. So you can just experiment with it. And it doesn't even say it in OpenAI's, document, OpenAI's documentation. I don't recommend them putting messages in like this. It doesn't really make sense. But it's just to show you that you can put so much custom information in there. Um, I'm just trying to give you the best example possible. Yeah, and the app that I'm building, it's a lot about looking at specific users in a chat and kind of ranking their commentary. Like, for example, that was an insightful comment or that was a dumb comment or <laughs> that was a, a comment related to career advice. Um, then there's also, so then you get really sophisticated. I mean, you can start to go wild with this, like describe the personality of the person commenting and then update their personality ranking because in our app, we are kind of creating custom course material based on your personality. So the chat bot is reading your personality when you comment. Um, so it's, this is really, it is kind of magic, the JSON response because, and it's weird also, it's weird, but it's, it, it's, I've never experienced like creative, it's, it's a different job now, software engineering, it's changing because of this blend of English and uh, code. So that's, that's my take on the system message. Probably the most important point because this is what will just supercharge your ability to build like insanely powerful apps. And then this is also really interesting. Nobody talks about this. Um, trying to, I want to phrase this simply. When they first rolled out GPT, it was less than two years ago. They had two endpoints. It was chat completion and it was predict. Predict was like finish this sentence or give me the name of a sock brand. Actually, you're going to be wanting to use that use case a lot. Like it's content generation versus chat response. Um, I've only got a few minutes, so I probably won't go into the other stuff, but what's so weird is that if you want the content generation functionality from GPT, and this is in their documentation, it has to go through the system message. There's no, it's always a chat imp interface, which is very weird, but really cool. And the reason why it's weird is because why would you ask a chat endpoint to finish a non-chat conversation? But that's how it works. Um, I had a, how much time do I have? Five minutes, so I'll go through this quickly. Last thing I was gonna talk about, there's two more points, so very quick. There's a lot of buzzwords in general, um, Langchain is an amazing tool. OpenAI is an amazing tool. I always recommend build with the design constraints of your own application. Don't use Langchain because it's a cool word or it's a cool tool. OpenAI is insanely powerful. You use Langchain when you want to start to get into more advanced agentic type architectures, really advanced chatbots using your own private data that's like rag or you want to do some fancier like chain calls point is you're building something use what makes sense for your application don't use the fancy stuff because then what happens is you miss the fundamentals of open ai which is the worst then you just you don't even really know what you're doing and that happens all the time open ai is the most is so powerful lang chain Use it as like a step two is my advice, unless like you're building an enterprise grade chatbot on day one. Um, so that's that. Um, that's really it. I was just going to talk a little bit more about um, me a little bit. If you scroll down, so yeah, so we are beta. We are in private beta with our app Upskill Hero. It's kind of like this self-discovery micro learning platform. If you scroll down, you can see a picture of it. And we are looking for beta testers. So you can hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to play around in the private beta, Steven Rubenstone. Four minutes. Yeah, so this has been a wild journey. This app started off as like a side project. It was supposed to be like a Pokemon Go experience for 
put placing learning tips, virtual markers on the map, absolutely insane like idea. And we actually made it work. And then users are like, this is not what we wanted. Like, this is cool, but we want to sit in our beds and learn, not run around the city. I thought I had the Pokemon brand. That's just a startup thing. Anyways, we've pivoted into this micro learning platform where you answer kind of personality questions about your career goals, your passions, even weird questions like what's your earliest memory? And people answer those questions together and it generates these custom learning tracks for you that are specifically designed to fill in these knowledge gaps. And designing the AI pipelines and designing these prompts, it is an amazingly cool project, a learning project. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody. We are looking for some testers. I'll share my knowledge. If you help me out, um, hit me up on LinkedIn. One thing that I've learned about this project is when you start to really push the power of these LLMs, everything goes back to like input and output. You have so many different inputs going into like, for example, creating a lesson for someone, their personality, their previous lesson, um, where they live, and then how you weight those input, input arguments in a prompt becomes an art form because the way you weight something is like the, the joke I give is like in the prompt, some of the most effective things you could do is this is really, 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 really important. And literally the, it's my programming is now how many reallys I have in the prompt and it works and it's creating like razor sharp lessons after a lot of iteration. But I never thought that my stacked reallys is going to become how I weight inputs. But that is so weird and so cool. Um, I also, uh, yeah, th please, I am, I am looking for testers. So hit me up on LinkedIn if you're interested. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is I also, a couple of years ago, I wrote a, a fantasy book um, called The Nest and Ear. And if you're early, new to coding, it introduces teenagers to coding through this fantasy story. And yeah, that's it. You can see I'm very enthusiastic about the LM stuff. I think everyone should be because it's just, it's weirdly powerful. Um, that's it. I don't know if they want, if anyone wants to ask questions. We have two minutes for, for questions. And Steve is in the chair a lot with us. Thank you, Steven. Any questions about his app, his book, or anything that he shared about the large range models and system? Anything. Yeah, you can yeah. also share something. There we go. When you said software is changing, then you become, you know, you're almost in a role that you can expect. So is that, did you mean by your person, like you have to think about what the answers to these questions are and try to ascertain the personality? So are you saying, or do you get this from databases? Oh, I guess are you I guess it's almost like two different questions. I guess from like are you asking like on a career level, like how a software engineer role is changing? Or how we're how the app works? Like how the, the app works, how you say Oh, upskill here, the way it gets the personality is just through like multiple choice questions and uh, like text based prompts. So you answer them like with you know your keyboard or you click on multiple choice answers. So that's, that's our, that's like the creativity of the startup. So it's like, it's taken a year to create, we have like a self discovery rubric where we just kind of classify certain things about you. And you can learn a lot about somebody from like two answers. Like it's a long, I don't want to give, I don't want to ramble, but like my, my mom was using it and she's like, what's well, something you always wanted to do, but you never did. And she answered, I wanted to be a doctor. And like we're looking, my family's looking at it like, you want to be a doctor? Like the point is, there's a lot of things you don't know about like people that you know really well because you never ask these like probing below the surface questions. So yeah, you can, you don't need that much data to learn. What are they passionate about? What are their goals? You can, and once you start there, you just ask more questions. You don't need a million questions. You need like five to get, start to get good results. If they answer with high, if they answer seriously. Yeah. Um, concepts and using Lenchain to make the change. And I'm trying to use a model that was developed for a specific language that is available on the housing base. Do I understand the concept correctly? So the, the like Lenchain, I can make the chain, but if I want to use a model that has been made public uh, on Heaven Chat, I need to figure out how I'm going to host that. The inputs, is that it? So, I guess there's some details to that question. The, the short answer is the beauty of Langchain is that 
it gives you interfaces to plug into those language models. So it should be the same literally as hitting open AI. It's just you're using different, whatever the parameters are to use that hugging face model. What I'm not sure about is I've never used a model that wasn't publicly available. Because if it's publicly available, you have the interface, you just make the request to the API, get the response. If you're talking about like a more like research LLM that's run non, non-public, I don't mean, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, but you said it was public, so it's... It, it is, but I'm confused whether I have to run it locally or I have to go figure out how to do it. Yeah, I have, not moved, I have not worked with... I was reading about this last night, actually, like what does it take to run it locally, but I've only worked with uh, language models that are publicly available. So I don't know that. I'm not an expert on that. I can answer, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it actually depends on the parameters your LLM is using. Uh, so GPUs actually have limitations on the memory they can hold. It holds the language model. So I think uh, 7 billion parameters or 10 billion parameters is actually very doable uh, with a solid one power GPU. But if you're doing anything beyond less than 100, Oh yeah, running it on your machine, I don't know. Yeah, it needs serious, I was reading it, it's millions and millions of dollars just to run GPT-4.0, I think, because uh, of the, the memory requirements. Um, okay, yeah. Thank you everyone for your questions, Stephen. Thank you.